Good afternoon. Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices for focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you for your letters and questions. We appreciate receiving them. We are very honored today to have Dr. Thomas Stelzer, who is the Dean and Executive Secretary of the International Anti-Corruption Academy since March 2020. He is an Austrian diplomat with a career focusing on the global issues and multilateral diplomacy. Prior to this, Dr. Thomas Seltzer was the United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs and Secretary of the United Nations Chief Executive Board he was also a lecturer at the Department of Political Science at Vienna University on global issues and the role of the United Nations. Dr. Thomas Stelzer was the permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations office in Vienna, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Preparatory Committee. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Stelter. Over to you, Dr. Stelter. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm greeting you from Rome International Airport. Uh, mm -hmm. I have spent the last days in Italy, in Rome, uh, negotiating uh, on uh, anti-corruption issues. And I'm just on the way back and uh, to be able to participate in this meeting, I uh, had to choose a, a, an unusual venue. Uh, I'm moving today and uh, have a flight after this meeting, which I wouldn't have been able to catch uh, had I participated from the city. So this is why you have an unusual background here. Uh, it's my great pleasure to talk about anti-corruption. I love to talk about anti-corruption because I think that's one of the greatest challenges of today. And of course, anti-corruption in the context of the SDGs that's really relevant and forward-looking. Now, the fight against corruption is a new, it's quite a new phenomenon. Corruption is old. You know, corruption has been with us as long as we can remember, but it was perceived like a black shadow over our life, uh, penetrating all areas of our daily life. And we didn't really have any means to fight it uh, in a very, uh, in a, in a focused way. Uh, only in about 20 years ago, a little bit more than 20 years ago, the international community took the first steps to structure the, uh, the, the issue and to, and to, start, um, to start developing a framework to, to fight uh, corruption. Uh, only in 1998, the General Assembly adopted the first resolution on corruption. I was not there at that time. But from then on, I happened to be at every stage of the development of the anti-corruption discourse uh, in the uh, multilateral framework. Uh, looking back to that, at least, it becomes very clear to me, you know, how these stages um, were unfolding. You know, back in fall of 2001, only a few months after it had uh, been assigned a permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations and other uh, offices uh, in Vienna, I chaired the, my first crime commission session in Vienna, and that very session adopted a resolution confirming that corruption is a structural impediment to sustainable development. We very true at that time, we didn't really understand the whole context and content of the statement, but it, um, it kept unfolding later and uh, obviously quite uh, very much influencing my life. A year later, in 2002, uh, we started in Vienna negotiating what later became uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC. This was a two-year uh, process, a little bit less than two years, uh, negotiating in Vienna. And uh, I, I was privileged to lead the negotiations on the last chapter, the implementation chapter of the convention. The convention was then uh, adopted by consensus uh, and opened for signature uh, in Merida in Mexico. 
This is why it's also called the Merida Convention. And uh, again, I was quite privileged that I was uh, authorized to sign this convention on behalf of Austria. That means my own signature is on the convention. Uh, in fact, the paper has absor absorbed my own handwriting in many different ways, uh, which of course gives me a very special affinity to this, to this uh, convention. And uh, also, I believe, a certain responsibility. Now, you know that very often in the United Nations context, we spend so much energy uh, and political will negotiating a good text. And then afterwards, we don't have the energy to implement it. Or nobody feels the ownership to implement the results of the tedious long processes. And very often, very valuable UN documents become dead wood, uh, which is a pity. Uh, so when I watched how uh, how slow the implementation process of this convention unfolded and decided in about 2007, we started thinking about what can we do to facilitate implementation of this convention. Maybe we should just say a few things about this convention because it's really the comprehensive framework we have today at our hands to fight corruption on the basis of the rule of law, excluding impunity in all its different aspects. You know, before we start prosecuting uh, uh, corruption, we have to think what is corruption? You know, what, what, there, there are many different interpretations, but there are common denominators. There is no existing global one definition of what corruption is. The, in the course of negotiations, we decided that uh, uh, it, was, it was just not possible to, uh, to agree on a global definition. So criminalization of corruption and defining it was left to the national uh, systems, to the national criminal law systems. So each country defines for itself what corruption means in its own context. Of course, you know, we know, we understand what corruption is, the strong common denominator, but there, is, there, are, there are some variations depending. For example, in Austria, my own country, uh, that applies a very large and wide definition for corruption, including, for example, in the times of the European football championship right now, uh, referees uh, in games outside of Austria. So if they take bribes, they fall under the, uh, under the uh, anti-corruption uh, um, uh, regulation of our criminal law. So uh, therefore, you know, we have to be aware each system has different needs uh, to, to build capacities to understand and implement the complex legal provisions of UNCAC. You know, first, you know, what is the starting point normally to fight, co fight corruption? The starting point is access to information. You know, the perpetrators try to, he to, to hide uh, what they have done. So access to information and transparency is, of course, the very first step to start a process. Here, you know, we, it's, it's very easy to follow, you know, who, who provides for us access uh, to transparency? Very often it's the whistleblowers. And the provisions in the convention for whistleblowers, for example, are quite weak. You know, uh, each state shall consider to protect whistleblowers. So here there's a lot of movement uh, in the international arena. Uh, to define exactly how whistleblowers should be protected uh, after they had provided access to us uh, to uh, actions which are subsumed under the criminal law, under the anti-corruption paragraphs. So the whole chapter of prevention, you know, uh, is, is quite, uh, is defining how high the threshold or how low the threshold uh, for, for corruption is. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the convention very well defines uh, what national institutions we need to bring together to harmonize politics uh, against corruption. That starts you know, from hiring of public officials, which needs to be meritory based. You know, there are many countries where higher officials uh, are family members. You know, they are hired at different uh, uh, angles and not always uh, meritory uh, considerations uh, are at the center. So selecting those who are entrusted with building uh, public institutions and good governance, uh, that's the first important step. 
financing of political parties. You know, so it's, it's another very strong uh, preventive uh, consideration. Uh, transparency in party financing, but also things like uh, we often read about, you know, these kleptocrats in different continents that steal money when they are presidents or high political officials. But then, of course, you know, if you look at the reality, in many countries, like in my own country, a president, when he finishes his tenure, uh, he's provided with an income, with an office, high respect. In many other countries, presidents, once they finish the tenure, they are they are out, you know, and if they haven't stolen, they go back where they came from. So this is very easy to understand that preventing uh, corruption also includes building institutions uh, which raise the threshold. By the way, you know, ch chapter five of our convention uh, is in connection here with this with this uh, famous kleptocrats uh, asset recovery. Uh, repatriation of funds which were illicitly acquired and transferred abroad. That's exactly the case uh, that applies to many of this of the situations where presidents or other politicians have uh, have amassed huge rich riches and transferred that abroad into foreign uh, accounts, hoping that one day they will be able to take advantage uh, of this money which they have transferred. Now, it has always been quite easy to locate this money, but extremely difficult to relocate it to where it belongs to. There were no, no legal provisions to do that. So UNCAC uh, regulated that in its uh, article, in its uh, chapter five, asset recovery. Uh, it gives us a framework and tells us exactly we, that how we have to work uh, together, international cooperation, exchange of information, uh, how to locate the assets, uh, it doesn't really specify then how we get them back the assets, but you know it lays the groundwork, which then has to be has to be translated into into a form which can be uh, implemented. So that's maybe by the way the politically most interesting chapter is this asset recovery, because it's it 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 just uh, aff affects so many countries uh, that have a strong interest in finding rules here. Uh, to get this money back into the economies to where uh, these funds belong. Sometimes these funds are huge, you know, they are billions. And uh, even if the money is frozen in the foreign bank accounts, they still form a part of the economic cycle. So there are very strong interests involved here to keep the money where it is and not to return it. So you need a legal framework that you can, you can uh, develop action which is, uh, which is rule of law based, uh, transparent, uh, predictable, uh, equitable, and that is in Nuce provided by the convention already. So the convention as such really gives us the framework to fight corruption uh, nationally on the basis of the rule of law and very efficiently. But, you know, there's always a but, because these legal provisions need to be translated. And, you know, in the UN context, and you all know the United Nations quite well, uh, one of the most important contributions the UN offers is technical assistance, capacity building. And in the framework, in the context of our convention here, that's exactly who and how translates the legal provision to the end users, to the practitioners who are supposed to implement it. Uh, when, if that is not provided, uh, implementation is lagging. So in 2007, uh, about, I got a little bit frustrated uh, witnessing the slow pace of uh, implementation of the convention. And we started considering uh, what we can do in practical terms. Now, my idea at that time was uh, to come up with a global program. I'm a great fan of global programs because global programs bring together all the political will and they dissect a very multifaceted complex issue like fighting uh, corruption put the parts apart and then uh, consider who does what uh, in the solution of the problem. Uh, in the best case scenario, of course, at certain point, coming up with a global anti-corruption architecture, defining how labor responsibilities should be, uh, should be divided and uh, entrusted with which institutions. So that's what we were looking at, starting to look at in 2007. Uh, before we could, my idea was to 
you know, there's, there's an institution in Vienna called UNODC, the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crimes. This is the UN office, which is responsible, among many other things, for the fight against corruption. Uh, they also are what they call them, they call themselves the guardians of UNCAC, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, uh, but they're not only the guardians. Guardians is a little bit of a pa passive expression. They also do very concrete work in the implementation, but on a normative level. They have been training lawmakers uh, to knit these normative networks which are needed to implement UNCAC on a normative level, to come up with strong, resilient criminal law systems, for example. So that's very important. But then, of course, the next step is how do you connect these normative systems with the implementation level? How do you connect that with, with uh, lawyers, with prosecutors, with practitioners in the field? And nobody was doing that. So the idea was at that time to start uh, developing projects in the context of UNCAC implementation, then build a program around the projects, and at a certain at a certain uh, stage, uh, come up with a structure, with a practical structure that can implement these programs and projects. The idea was to do this within the United Nations, but in with an independent office. Some of you might be familiar with UNICRI in, in Torino, which is a, a research institution on uh, international criminal law, which is about the same as what I had imagined, you know, for the structure, something freestanding, but under the oversight of the United Nations, in this case, the UNODC. Uh, during that process, uh, while we were preparing, uh, I was called to New York, so I had to leave the process. And uh, as uh, you have, we have uh, mentioned before, I joined the United Nations uh, as Assistant Secretary General for Policy um, um, uh, Control, and uh, and I had to leave the process, and because I was very very busy with many other things. So in my absence, uh, my team of people continued uh, with this idea, and then finally in 2010 uh, established what today is IACA, the International Academy. Anti-Corruption uh, Academy. I was at the at the at the uh, at the, uh, at the conference uh, that established the, the the institution, the IACA, uh, accompanying Ban Ki Moon. It was in Vienna. It was a very impressive conference. So the IACA got a very good start into its practical life in 2010. So I lost a little bit sight. I have to admit. Uh, in the meantime. And uh, I was quite surprised when I was offered to return uh, to the field of anti-corruption just a year and a half ago, uh, which of course I couldn't refuse because in the meantime, it has become very clear that uh, the fight against corruption has become center stage in the UN system. And why? Here we enter uh, the topic, the SDGs. You know, in uh, 2015, uh, a long process, a very complicated negotiation process was, was successfully concluded in the UN framework where the 195 member countries negotiated what was adopted later as the Agenda 2030 and the 17 SDGs by consensus. So this was a great achievement. And as you know, the SDGs are breaking down the entire global agenda into 16 goals, into 15 goals, in fact. Why 15 goals? Because 16, is good governance. 16 goes called 16 is the framework which is needed to implement the 15 content goals. And apart in, and you know, all these SDGs have very clean and clear targets. And target five of SDG 16 is the fight against corruption. So suddenly, the fight against corruption became the cross cutting agenda of the entire SDG system. And if you look at reality today, you know, the United Nations is, uh, is in a very difficult situation today, uh, you know, for many different reasons. It's a little bit restabilizing, but it's still facing enormous challenges. And from a pragmatic point of view, uh, of course, the Secretary General has to consider what is it he can implement? Where are the low hanging fruits? Uh, where, where can the UN make a real difference? And here, of course, uh, we have to look at what we have achieved and what is there to be implemented. 
And as you all know, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, he achieved two, two really remarkable results uh, by negotiating and by getting adopted the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. So this is really, this was a, a monumental success. And right now there's not much out there which would galvanize the international energy and political will uh, to make the next step. So we are now considering how do we implement what we have, which means the SDGs and the Paris Climate uh, Agreement. Now for implementation, you always need funds. You know, it's very clean and clear how much funds you need to, to implement the SDGs. And these funds we just don't have, you know, right now. Or at, least, at least we don't raise them. You know, haven't raised a different issue. You know, until COVID, uh, we were, it was very clear, but at least we have been always struggling to raise uh, very limited funds. Uh, during the COVID process, suddenly we became aware that funds can be unlimited. And funds that we had never considered possible were suddenly made available and nearly parachuted. Uh, into economies, which of course has many implications. So, but for uh, long-term planning, we are always struggling, of course, uh, to raise the funds like for the SDGs. And here the idea is, how do we help member states increase tax revenue? Some of which in the best case scenario could be used for SDG implementation. That's right now one of the very biggest uh, questions. Now, if you look at reality, you know we have this we have this we have this huge challenge, you know, which uh, you know raising the funds and at the same time looking at these enormous illicit financial flows, which have been siphoning away from productive economies enormous amounts of money, which we can't really exactly quantify because we don't really know how to measure bribery and corruption. So, you know, this illicit flows, they consist of four aspects, you know, tax evasion, tax avoidance, bribery and corruption. And these amounts of money are estimated to go into the trillions every year, trillions of dollars. This is so much money that cannot be compensated for neither by direct investments, nor by official development assistance, nor by remittances. So it becomes clean and clear. And that this narrative is, is taking shape uh, in the United Nations that to be able to even start implementing the SDGs, we need some success in limiting these illegal illicit flows, meaning some success in fighting corruption. So suddenly corruption has become a precondition, a condition sine qua non for the implementation of the SDGs. And this is not where we stand right now. You know, starting in 98 with the first General Assembly resolution, then the adoption of this resolution by the Crime Commission, then the negotiation adoption of the, of the um, convention. And now con we're finding the fight against corruption as the cross-cutting agenda uh, in the SDGs, which gives us a whole new opportunities, but also challenges. Two weeks ago in New York, uh, I, I participated in the United Nations Special Session Against Corruption, UNGAS 2021. You all know that. You know, UNGAS 21 uh, just made it very clear where we stand today with corruption. And this is quite amazing. You know, uh, corruption today, in my analysis, is the only global issue which is not divisive. If you look at global issues, you know, that Kofi Annan wants to find as the issues without borders, uh, too big to be resolved by one country, uh, where we all have to come together and find solution, uh, cooperative solutions, global solutions. Most of these, or nearly all of the global issues are interpreted very differently in the North from the South. So they have the potential of division. They're very divisive. And in my pretty long career uh, with and for and within the United Nations, I only encountered two moments where we 
had global issues which were bringing everybody together. The first time was after 9-11, where the global issue, the fight against terrorism, united the world. So it was the first time that the global issue brought us all together. And now, 20 years later, it's the fight against corruption. Nobody today can say this is not important. They, they belittle it. Everybody is now on board to fight corruption. Of course, not everybody with the same intensity, some pay only lip service, but everybody supports the fight against corruption today, which is a huge opportunity to move on and to really build structures uh, which, which really in reality create more resilient anti-corruption systems, which have to be based on two columns, uh, criminal law and also societal, to raise the threshold for corruption, to make sure that corruption doesn't pay, that nobody can, can assume that they can get away with corruption. They can have access to the funds they have expatriated, or they will have access to the money uh, which they amass through corruption. Uh, because, because we need to be able to exclude impunity. So if we get there, I mean, uh, this is a big vision, of course, and this is a far away, and you're not living in a perfect world. It might take a few years until you get to this point. But right now is the time to move forward, because right now we have the momentum. So we are finding ourselves right now in these unique uh, historic situations where everybody is supporting, is first recognizing the importance and then supporting the fight against corruption. Okay, so that's... Uh, the my analysis, but who does this now? You know, who in the international system uh, has a mandate to fight uh, corruption? Well, many. There are many international organizations which have been contributing uh, to fighting corruption. You know, the central in the international system is the Vienna Office of the United Nations, the UNODC, on the normative level. The UNDP, that you all know, has been uh, implementing a lot of anti corruption projects, programs. UNESCO, does a lot of teaching against corruption. So there are a lot of organizations that contribute, but nobody is really coordinating that. There's no switchboard. There's nobody who really connects the dots, who brings the system together, who produces the famous UN synergies, who prevents the wheel from pre being uh, reinvented every day. And so there is a huge gap. In fact, the only international organization that is exclusively dedicated to the holistic fight against corruption is my little organization, the International Anti-Corruption Academy. As small as we are, but we're the only ones out there uh, which are dedicated uh, to the holistic fight against corruption. So maybe I should tell you a little bit about what we are doing uh, to give you some understanding and to, to give you some background for, for questions uh, afterwards. Um, you know, our organization has two comparative advantages. First, it is, as I said, the only international organization uh, which is dedicated to the fight against corruption. We are now having 80 parties, 76 member states, and four mm -hmm. member organizations. Hopefully, the tendency of raising quickly now. In addition, we are the only international organization which is also, at the same time, an institution of higher learning. We're the only international organization org authorized to award academic degrees. So uh, our technical assistance program is very much based on providing uh, academic programs, uh, continuing education for practitioners. We are having two, traditionally two master's programs that we offer. Uh, one is more theoretically academic, the other one is more practically, more compliance oriented. Uh, both of them are consisting of 120 ETCS points, uh, include a master's thesis and qualify for continuing into PhD programs. This is what we have been offering. In the past, in a conservative way, face to face, our students will come to Vienna, our students will come to, uh, would, uh, would meet with their teachers there, uh, so we were limited by the numbers because we had to fly students uh, around the world and all to Vienna. But nevertheless, in these last 10 years, we were able to create 
3,000 alumni, uh, which were all either participating in the master's programs or in the other complementary programs uh, we have been offering. 3,000 students in 162 countries, which is quite a lot because they're all bridgeheads, uh, multipliers, they all have their networks. Uh, most of them appreciate what they've learned through the academy and uh, they, they implement what they've learned in their own realities. So the idea is that all these uh, prosecutors, lawyers, academicians, judicial personnel, uh, civil servants in different ministries, justice, interior, uh, who all already have uh, a degree. Uh, now it's most of them admit mid mid at mid career recognize that a specialization would suit them well. Then they come and they participate in the programs uh, where they learn based on their own expertise and their previous education to fight corruption in a more concentrated and more focused way, which is a win-win situation. Of course, they come they. Uh, we help them build the capacity to fight corruption more efficiently. They do the work better. And of course, they're eligible for uh, better jobs in the future, better income. Uh, they do the work better, better work satisfaction. So this is a win-win situation. So when I came on board a year ago, and I had my first meeting with my staff, and I discussed uh, my vision for the next years, I told them and I'm very impressed by what they have been doing. But what we have to do now is we have to dramatically scale up our diffusion capacities. We cannot be satisfied with training 3,000 people because there are tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of practitioners out there who, who can benefit from what we have to offer. So the question is, how do we reach out to all these possible constituents and offer them capacity building and uh, technical assistance to do their job better? This is where we stand right now. You know, you can imagine that my team, you know, uh, was quite surprised by my by my challenge, by me challenging them. And it's always a little bit difficult to get people out of the comfort zone, especially when they've been doing a good job. But 14 days after my arrival, uh, you know, we were all locked down by the COVID situation. So suddenly we could not deliver programs anymore face to face which was fatal for, of course, for many and also for us, because much of our income is derived from program delivery. You know, we're not for profit, so the fees are low, but still we recover the costs and we couldn't deliver programs anymore. So we were facing the alternative either to close down or to re reinvent ourselves, which we did. So within six weeks, we translated nine years of expertise and content into an e-learning base. And six weeks after the COVID uh, caused lockdowns, we continued providing our master's programs, but now with the students not coming to Vienna, but sitting on five continents, following our modules, and the lecturers connected virtually from the offices. So we immediately recognized, of course, the opportunities here. Because first, we didn't have to fly students around anymore and teachers, we could dramatically uh, limit our ecological footprint, the costs, plus, you know, now with our students uh, participating from their homes or their offices, they didn't have to take a sabbatical anymore. So they could do their work and their continuous training uh, in the afternoons, in the evenings. In addition, and you know, the lectures also, previously, when, when one of our international lecturers was teaching a class, uh, the, he or she had to carve out a week of a busy schedule to fly to Vienna, overcome the jet lag and all the stuff. None of this anymore. We can connect our lectures now from their offices, which is very easy, very efficient and very direct. So that means suddenly the COVID situation helped us to do exactly what I had suggested, uh, dramatically scale up our uh, diffusion, our delivery uh, capacity. Now, what is the new vision? Who, is, who are our clients? Who are the uh, people we treat, to, to try, to, try to reach out to? Basically, there's no limit. I think we have to reach out to all managers of the international system, uh, to all civil servants in the ministries, to all future diplomats, 
but also to the managers of the private sector, because the stress is on all of them. You know, if you see the the, the legal framework, it does of course not only consist of UNCA, there's also UNTOC, which is the Convention Against Organized Crime, and complemented by, by the OECD uh, Convention Against Bribery, which only has 55 members, but the implementation process of which is very fact much advanced, and which raises the compliance levels in national economies. That means internationally working companies have to, have to comply with the new increased standards to do business in the economies. So there is now a new stress on the on international uh, uh, companies to increase, to scale up their own compliance capacities, uh, which they do with the help, you know, they can have private, private sector capacity building providers, uh, consultants, or they come to an intergovernmental organization and here we're the only one. So this is a huge area of growth, uh, which is extremely interesting for us. And if you look at the global investment trends, you know, of the huge pension funds and of the trends, I think it's a, it's, it becomes very clear that investments are increasingly channeled uh, into economies that have initiated the transition from fossil to sustainable energy. There is a less clear but already identifiable trend that also compliance considerations are taken into account here, and this is what we want to emphasize. You know, I think in in a short uh, time, uh, these compliance considerations will be very important. So there is an additional incentive for companies to scale up their compliance uh, capacities, and that's a huge market for us. So I was in New York the, the other day. Uh, talking with the Global Compact, you know, that's the UN office that brings together tens of thousands of companies, all of which have signed 10 principles. The last one of which is anti-bribery and corruption. So it's a perfect entry point. At the same time, and this is now for Mariam's uh, clients and board members at the Davos Forum, you know, we are already uh, content providers for the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, partners of the Pachi system and uh, partnering and scaling up this, this cooperation. And hopefully, when, if or when better, the wars will take place uh, in reality, not virtually, but in person again, we'll be there, of course, uh, carrying the flag and trying to introduce the idea of fighting corruption and uh, increasing the compliance levels uh, in this. You know, the, the boss is you know in, the boss is extremely interesting, of course, because it's not the CEOs who go to the boss, who have short-term uh, business uh, considerations, maximizing shareholder uh, profits, but the owners, who have much longer uh, timelines. So I think it's a very interesting opportunity to translate the fight against corruption and anti-bribery uh, into the private sector via the divorce platform. There's also a network against corruption or existing in, in Davos, uh, which we can uh, which we can uh, work with. So, what? How does this work exactly look like? You know, what is? What are the stages uh, we are we are uh, looking at uh, while we provide this technical existing capacity building? Well, the first, of course, is to help our constituents see where corruption happens. That's the first stage. You know, corruption very often is hidden. And there's a good reason to hide it. Uh, and since corruption looks differently in each legal system, uh, we have the first step is to help constituents see what is corruption and where does it happen. The second stage is to help our constituents understand that fighting corruption is now a shared interest, that it makes sense, that we can no longer afford the enormous externalities of corruption the hidden costs, the economic, political, and social costs of corruption. And the third stage is to offer technical assistance, capacity building to fight corruption directly and in reality, implementing the provisions we have. So that's our three, our three stage uh, approach. Have to see, have to understand, have to do. Now, how do we do that? You know, first with our academic programs, which were diversifying. Because not everybody needs 120 ETCS points, the practitioners need less. 
so that it may be 80 points. They don't need to have a massive thesis. They want to increase their capacities. So we're diversifying here. Second, uh, immediately after I arrived, my first joint project was with UNITA, the research branch of the United Nations. Uh, we developed a joint master's program in anti-corruption diplomacy, which we're implementing now. We're starting this program in September. It's open for admissions already. And this program will become sort of an aircraft carrier for our efforts. Because in many countries, people tell me, we want to educate our diplomats, make them sensitive, help them see where corruption happens and understand the international system better. So we can use this program now to train diplomats worldwide, virtually. They can sit in their embassies all over the world and can follow the module the program. Once they have completed the module, they emigrate to the next one. And once they've done the eight modules, they get the degree. So that's a huge uh, opportunity for us. We are also offering many other uh, programs and projects from webinars to courses for pay, without pay. It's worthwhile checking our homepage and see what we offer. www.iaca, International Anti-Corruption Academy, .int. Our second pillar are the uh, tailor-made programs, where we work with constituents, member states, international institutions, but also with civil society uh, to demand-driven, to come up with concrete projects which help them strengthen the anti-corruption systems, make them more resilient. You know, here we teach civil servants in many different countries, in Ministry of Justice, in the interior, uh, but it's not limited. Recently, we helped one of the Gulf countries uh, establish an anti-corruption department in the civil uh, bureaucracy. Now we're helping uh, an, an African country that has recently established an anti-corruption ministry to build this ministry. Under this report, we also subsume our uh, capacity building for the private sector. So this is a huge area without any limits. We work with our uh, constituents to, to define the projects to make them as focused as possible, to increase their impact, of course, to also make the products or projects are more valuable, so they pay for them, of course, you know, that's also a consideration, uh, in negotiation and consultation with those who benefit. Our third column is research. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a strong defender of evidence-based decision-making. We have to provide decision makers with evidence. Otherwise, they cannot come up with a narrative. And Dr. we can see that. Yes? Dr. Stelter, I hate to interrupt you because <laughs> it's fascinating, but it is already I have still, 12 I have still two minutes. I have still two minutes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you, you, gave, you gave me 45. I was, I was uh, shaping it, and I, I'm done in two minutes. OK. okay. I just want to complete this quick overview. Uh, so I, I really believe in, in offering evidence to decision makers, which you need to draw from research. You know, we saw it in the COVID crisis. Those governments who relied on experts did much better than the other governments. It's the same in the fight against corruption. So where do we draw research? Uh, the effects from research. There's a lot of research being done. It's fragmented, very difficult to access. So our first step, what we're working on right now is creating a global repository of anti-corruption research. You know, in, in practical terms that everybody has a question can click himself or herself uh, through our homepage to the results, a one-stop shop. The second stage will be uh, to build a limited own research capacity to define the gaps in research and to lead research to where it uh, creates the most, uh, the best rate of return. And the, on the third stage, we will be introducing by the end of this year, a PhD program, uh, which will complement the three pillars, the academic pillar, the tailor-made programs and the research pillar, and which will bring together a global efforts, academic efforts. You know, there are many universities with centers of excellence against uh, on working on, uh, on the rule of law and anti-corruption, but there is very little structure, very little integrated platform. So this is what we want to provide. So I stop here. It's exactly 45 minutes. Uh, I thank you very much for your patience, Christine. Uh, and 
the floor is open. You know, if there are questions, I'd be very yes, happy to respond. Yes, there's uh, one of the reasons I hated to interrupt you, but we have fa many, many questions, and I okay. hate to stop you because your research and presentation is absolutely phenomenal, and you are absolutely right. And I have. I do a lot of research and some of the research is coming out, particularly about COVID is just very disturbing. But anyway, I am going to forward to Ariel who has all the questions and uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer some of them. Ariel, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Derbeck. And thank you so much for such a brilliant presentation. That was such an amazing, Presentation. Ariel, ask the question. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first question is How many high profile cases of corruption has IACA uncovered so far, and have you been able to communicate this to the international news media? This is a question I cannot really co co concretely answer. I don't know how many cases there were. You know, the most high, high profile cases are taken up by the media increasingly. And uh, these are very painful processes when the media point to these gaps here and to how we suffer from corruption, how much money is siphoned out. But I see an increasing trend that the media is getting more and more interested to uncover that. You know, in, uh, it's, there, there's no real statistics of how many cases there are. And we are not prosecutors. You know, my academy, we are not prosecuting cases. We are building resilient systems to, to, to lift the threshold and to avoid corruption cases. So the, our cooperation with media to shed light on what is trying to be hidden, to provide information, the human right to information, to provide transparency, to protect whistleblowers uh, by building protective systems. You know, whistleblowers are a big issue. You know, some of the, of the most advanced uh, the democracies uh, exile all the whistleblowers you know so this is something which is a weakness because we need in access to information to prosecute corruption so this is a good question but there's just no uh, exact answer to that at least i don't have it thank you along that line who are your most effective partners in the private sector in particular financial institutions, and are they helping you out with transparency of corrupt individuals or leaders? Uh, well, there, there, again, I see an increasing trend of interest from the private sector. You know, we have a, a whole list of private sector companies who request technical assistance from us. You know, for example, one of our most important partners, Siemens. You know, as you all know, this was a very famous case, and Siemens was condemned to pay a lot of money for previous sins uh, by investing in institutions like us. So Siemens has been supporting us, and we use this money for technical assistance and also for financial aid to students who qualify for our programs and who couldn't participate, and also for, for strengthening and financing our alumni networks. So one of my goals is and visions to make our programs accessible for everybody, like in least developed countries. You know, people might have a big need for capacity building, but they might not be able to participate. Even the, I mean, our costs are not very high. So Westerners can afford them. Many people around the world, for them it's unaffordable. So we would try to establish funds to make a, 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 a financial assistance available for those who are interested, for those who qualify, but cannot afford to participate. We do this in cooperation with the private sector and also with donor countries, where we are the switchboard, demand oriented. We try to connect the demand for our programs with the supply for funds. That is absolutely excellent. I do the same thing. But anyway, how? what is the number of your students that you have? Well, so far, 3,000 alumni. But now, and, and I, I have to spill this out now, because maybe there is in, in your illustrious group of participants, somebody can help me here. So I, if you allow me, I, this is my private. You know, what, what I'm facing, the biggest challenge I'm facing now is to go on scale. You know, we are not very well known. And people are not aware how to, how to find corruption. 
many people would want to come on board, but they just don't know. They are not aware of the means we have, uh, of the technical assistance programs we have. So how do we spread the message? In practical terms, when I sit in front of my computer and try to work, you know, very often a book flashes up on the screen that I have been looking at Amazon.com two days ago, or another object that I've been discussing with a friend. That means somebody seems to know what I want and the needs. Plus, somebody seems to be able to write algorithms to target me. You know, they call this targeted advertisement. Now, we are not for profit, so I don't want to use the term advertisement. But my challenge, my question is, how do you get to the point that when a prosecutor in South Sudan or an academician in Myanmar or a lawyer you know, in Peru sits in front of the, of the workstation and thinks, how can I resolve an issue related to fight against corruption? Suddenly an icon flashes up and the Corruption Academy, try us out, go to our homepage, see what we offer. Maybe you find a product that is interesting for you and that helps do your work better. And then we, we, you know, you can just search and 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 go into the detail, go vertically, and uh, so this is where I want to get that uh, that we we overcome this these limitations and uh, these barriers, and that we can target uh, everybody who could benefit from our programs uh, as professionals, uh, as practitioners, as researchers. Uh, this is what I want to get. So if you have one of your students who is an IT whiz and he can write me uh, write algorithms for me to get me there, uh, we come a long way together. Excellent. We, we try to do the same thing, but that is an excellent perspective. If advertisement can send Coca-Cola and hot dogs, etc., we really should be able to uh, expand information about what really impedes progress in this world. Absolutely correct. Ariad, back to you. Questions? Yeah, so I also wanted to ask, have you thought about using social media or have you taken up social media at all for your outreach? Yes, 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 yes. We try to use all social media available, you know, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not your age, so I'm a little bit outdated. So I need advices. You know, my children tell me, Daddy, this is what we use today. You know, I'm very old fashioned. I still use Facebook. You know, my kids say, this is, you know, Daddy, you're the only one in the family who uses Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we try to keep updated and to use the social media. But the, again, you know, I see social media influencers who have to say very little, but they have 80 million followers. <laughs> You know, I don't know how they do that. I would like to get there. You know, I would like to have five, 200 million followers just to spread the, the message. Let's fight corruption together. Let's make your lives better. And let's fight corruption. Do, if anybody can advise me how to do that, again, I'd be very happy. But we use social uh, media as much as we can. It is not a popular topic, unfortunately, uh, but basically, and quite honestly, from my own experience, you have to start putting it into their brains when they are very young. With the yeah. ones that are 14, 15, 16, by the time they get to their 20s, very, very difficult. You know, I, I'm a strong defender of, of education programs. You know, this is, this is an increasing trend. You know, the G20 right now in the anti-corruption working group, they introduced this education as in, in, in the context of technical assistance. So we are on board there. But we, it's not only training practitioners, we have to educate children. You now, recently I was sitting in Cartagena in Colombia with the mayor and he's a mo one of the most incredible figures, you know, he was exiled for his fight against corruption. He was pressed Columbia. He returned two years ago. He ran against eight other candidates on an anti-corruption ticket he won. And now he's doing a marvelous job, you know, risking his life, but introducing education, anti-corruption education in schools already. So the 10 years old go home and say, Daddy, how much money did you have to pay you to get a job? Daddy, when you get your envelope with your salary at the end of the month, is somebody taking money out of it, you know? So these are the questions, and this is the consciousness, the making people conscious that everybody loses through corruption. 
you know, in many countries today, uh, where the infrastructure is weak uh, and where there's no bank branches, people would go and get the salary with a credit card, with a card, you know, from a money machine. So they take the money out of the money machine. And suddenly they recognize, oh my God, I had, a, I had a huge increase in salary. No, they didn't have an increase, but nobody's taking money out of the envelope anymore on the way to, 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 to those who defend it. So these are very easy things. And, you know, pub, public e-procurement, e for example, very important. You know, who, if you pay with cash, it's very difficult to control. Uh, if, you, if you do it via the internet, you leave traces. It's very difficult to hide. So this is, for example, e-procurement in public procurement is so important. Or use of high tech, use of, of social media, you leave traces, you know, you increase transparency. So this is very, very uh, relevant. Thank you for this question. Uh, Ariel, back to you. We have five minutes left. So most important questions only. Do you feel that the UN is doing enough to prioritize your organization in the international stage? Uh, no, no, but uh, this is not a criticism, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm an only UN, you know, the UN is my bio talk, and I, I know exactly how to, how, to, how to do things and how to build institutions. We are still outside the UN system. So what I'm, I'm now on the trip to, add, to, to advocate what we can do, how we can add value to the global system in fighting corruption. There is nobody in the UN who is specializing in that. So we are already treated as an external player. We are included increasingly into, uh, into the UN. The outcome paper of the recent UNGAS invited us to strengthen our relationship with the United Nations institutions. We're going to do that. I'm going to open our liaison office in New York to be close to where things happen, that we can offer our assistance, our capacity building, our partnerships uh, to all UN organizations. You know, if I was a secretary general, you know, I would put all my dice now on limiting uh, illicit financial flows, fighting corruption. I would appoint a special representative who, who, who raises, you know, political will there are many people out there, politicians, who would be very willing to come on board. You know, I was very recently, I was invited to Colombia, where the president has decided to use yeah, the right. last one and a half years of his tenure to leave an anti-corruption legacy. You know, so this is very strong. And many others want to do that too. So somebody has to bring these people together. When I was sitting with the mayor of, 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 of uh, Cartagena, and he told me this incredible story, what he's doing, I said to him, Mr. Mayor, you're the person I'm looking for. He said, why? He said, because in local government, many people want to do the same as you, but they don't know how to do it. They're too to shy, they're too cautious. We need to, to multiply your good example. So he said, how do you want to do this? I say, I have an idea now. We will create now here a global alliance of anti-corruption cities. You carry the flag, I support you. In the meantime, I have several cities already in this network. Recently, I got confirmation that a Nigerian city in the middle of the Boko Haram influence is joining out this network. So we can diffuse the information. This gives me a lot of hope. You know, there's a lot of interest, but somebody has to carry the flag and somebody has to build these platforms to, to, to just, uh, you know, make people, uh, you know, aware that there is a way to do it and progress is in our lab. We can do it but it won't happen if we don't do it. So oh. there's all these things, there's no limitation to, to imagination and to network building, to amplify the experience of a few, make them available, bring people on board, diffuse the best practices. This is what we're doing. Well, it would help if it wasn't that the UN functions on, not on the majority, but on consensus. And that is the biggest problem. I completely agree with you. You, you just I, cannot I did have... Not, but, but I did not say this. I, I believe in consensus. I think it's important. But consensus, what is the result? There's no doubt about that. That's but right. also, in the UN processes, while you create consensus, you have to create shared ownership. You know, you have to make sure that everybody who is in the process feels that he has a piece of the success. Only then they will go and implement the result afterwards. Plus, then you need a way to keep them accountable. 
you hold them accountable. How do we call, hold decision makers accountable? How do we make sure that uh, a country which has participated in negotiation of the of the SDGs or the Anti-Corruption Convention afterwards does what they have promised? Here we need civil society, young people, who tell the politicians, we hold you accountable. You know, we raise you know, right now, for example, in my own country, Austria, they 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 started a plebiscite against corruption. This is a best practice. You know, we want to multiply this all over the world. If 195 UN countries start plebiscites against corruption, that's going to have an impact. You know, politicians will be held accountable to do after the elections what they have promised before. Not only being voted out of office, but being held accountable continuously by citoyens, you know, by active citizens, young people, uh, civil society, NGOs, academicians, the private sector, you know, who earns more if we cut out uh, corruption. So it's it's very easy, you know, to, to come up with the arguments. We have to do that and diffuse them, distribute them. Well, Dr. Stelz, that's a wonderful goal uh, that we can end on. Uh, it, thank you for a brilliant presentation. We are most, most grateful. And we do hope that uh, all of our listeners are going to seriously undertake a mission to work on this, on the project, which is really influences and can be, how should I say it, can work toward the betterment of our situations right now. And with that, uh, I just want to point out to our listeners that our next briefing uh, is going to be on July 4th, and it's going to be Dr. Martin von Hildebrand, uh, who is ethnologist and anthropologist who has done a great deal for the pro protection of the Colombian Amaz Amazon tropical forests. With that, thank you again very, very much. And Ariel, thank you. And Mariam, thank you for in actually inviting uh, Dr. Stelzer to be with us. And I do hope that we'll be able to um, invite you once again when you have a little bit less more time <laughs> and you do not have such yeah. great stress. So I, will, I will always be short of time, but I will always be available. <laughs> Thank and you I hope much. I hope that I hope that we can bring some people in this shared goal, join the fight against corruption. Please uh, support that. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thank trip. You. Bon voyage. Thank you. Have a good Thank you. <laughs> Danke. Alles Gute. Wiederhören. Danke. Thanks Dankeschön. a lot. Bye. <laughs> okay.